Um, well, it's a, real, it's a real pleasure to introduce our uh, pre presenters today. Uh, we have three people who are presenting, and uh, they're presenting on the paper that we shared with you, the link that we shared to the science paper. Uh, the first author on that paper is Noah Snyder Mackler. He's at University of Washington and now at Arizona State University for about the last six months. Noah's work focuses on uh, the, the intersection between social environment and the genome. We also have Jenny Tung. She's my colleague in evolutionary anthropology at Duke and also in the Population Research Institute at Duke and many other affiliations. Uh, her research focuses on the interplay between genes and behavior and the implications of this relationship for evolutionary biology and human health. And lastly, we have Dan Belsky from the School of Public Health at Columbia University. His research is at the intersection of public health, population, and behavioral sciences, and genomics. Now, all of, these, uh, all of these speakers today, these presenters today, are also associated with the Social and Biological Determinants of Health Working Group, uh, which I am happy to try some supported uh, some years back. Uh, we were one of the supporters. There are many others. You can look in the paper at all the acknowledgments. Uh, but I was very happy to see Tricem listed there. And we were, we were enthusiastic to support, support this working group because um, it was one that crossed disciplines involving people from the social sciences as well as evolutionary and biology and many different aspects of social sciences and evolutionary and biology. And it also connected faculty from Duke and UNC. And so that really fit in with our mission at Tricem to connect the local universities to cross disciplines and connect faculty across the institutions. So with that, I'll turn things over to, uh, to our presenters. And I think Noah has some slides. Yep. Uh, one sec here. Everyone see that? Nice and big? Yeah. Great. Uh, Charlie and Meredith, thanks so much for inviting us in to, to this to present here at Club, at Club FMed um, to talk about our recent review paper. I actually just wanted to start off by showing what a sort of unique interdisciplinary group of researcher, researchers this is. Uh, we have 14 co-authors on the paper, but there were many more who participated in that social and biological determinants of health working group uh, at UNC and Duke, which I just was searching through my email and realized that it started, its inception was November 3rd, 2015. So almost five years ago, we started that group. Um, it was led in large part by, by Jenny. Uh, and also Mike Shanahan, who's now at, uh, at Zurich. Uh, you can see all the co-authors here. Uh, Jenny and I will be representing the, those who study non-human animals and Dan representing those who study human animals. Uh, and again, we have sort of a 50-50 split between those two types of researchers. Now, this paper was really driven by a, a suite of observations from our own and, and others' work establishing this really strong association between the social environment and health in humans and other social animals. Now, these social gradients are really of interest to social scientists who are motivated to contribute to policy that ultimately improves human health, and also to evolutionary biologists interested in the origins of sociality and the determinants of, of Darwinian fitness. Now, some of the largest data sets on the health correlates of, of social adversity come from human populations. And these show that social adversity predict morbidity and mortality in humans. Uh, together, they really demonstrate that high social adversity is, is a major predictor of, of life expectancy, which is shown in the top row there. We have mortality uh, as a function of socioeconomic status, so income, uh, social connection, social network indices, and uh, cumulative early life adversity. And then uh, that's, that high social adversity is also a, a major predictor of susceptibility to a broad range of diseases and, and ailments shown there in the bottom row. Again, showing income, social network, connection, social integration, and the number of adverse uh, childhood experiences. I'm gonna hand it over to Dan briefly to explain the next couple of slides. Okay, uh, thanks Noah. Um, the figure you see in front of you is uh, sometimes called a rainbow. Uh, it's one of the earliest visual representations of the diverse, uh, what we call social determinants of health in humans. Uh, it comes out of the Institute for Future Studies and the authors are in fact not even PhDs, but you'll see it uh, all over human social science research uh, and particularly its policy translation. 
And I think the important thing to take away from this figure is that uh, those of us who study social determinants of health in humans think of it as a big tent kind of a discipline. Um, you'll see represented in the diagram determinants that range from um, individual psychosocial experiences, uh, which include discrimination, victimization, uh, bullying in some research, um, to community level social resources, to the physical environments that people inhabit, including uh, various kinds of toxic and exposures, as well as uh, the, the sorts of resources and affordances uh, that make health possible. Uh, and then there's this kind of general social and cultural uh, umbrella around them. That's all right, you, you can continue. I think the, the, the main takeaway from the rainbow is just that uh, you name it, uh, people are studying it as a component of social determinants of health. And that's part of the big idea here. Uh, the other feature of social determinants of health research in humans is this idea of uh, what's called a fundamental cause. And what's being illustrated um, in this figure from a, a commentary that Bruce Blink and Joe Fellon published many years ago now, um, is that the gap in, in this case, life expectancy, but, but it could also be a health phenotype between people with low levels of socioeconomic status, so people who are economically poor, people who are socially disadvantaged, as compared to people with high socioeconomic status, persists, in this case, over time, but we can also infer across uh, a wide range of absolute levels of resources or of deprivation. So um, from 1800 to 1950, the level of uh, resources that went along with any given uh, position in a socioeconomic hierarchy increased dramatically. But even though the floor was raised, this gradient in health persisted. Um, and, and the fundamental cause theory, uh, as it's come to be known, is that no matter what level of resources you ensure across the population, uh, there will persist some socioeconomic gradient in health because position at the top of the hierarchy itself has certain health benefits and position at the bottom of the health uh, of the social hierarchy has certain health costs. So these are not, um, these health effects are not dependent on some absolute level of deprivation or resource. They instead reflect relative differences um, and, and the, the social and psychological perceptions of those relative differences. Thanks, Dan. So d despite the strength of the association between social gradients and health and survival, there are still many unknowns that we tried to point out in this, this uh, review. Um, the first is that many studies are correlational in humans and non-human animals, which means we don't know if this link between the social environment and, and health and mortality outcomes is causal. It's often called social causation. So does a poor social environment directly lead to poor uh, health? Um, or as in some human studies, as some human studies and non-human studies have shown, are there mediating factors such as access to healthcare, which have been shown to be strong really contributing factors to this link? Uh, conversely, or additionally, uh, sorry, there. Uh, poor health could also precede one being in a poor social environment. This reverse causality or health selection suggests that individuals of poor health tend to find themselves and ultimately end up in poorer environments. Um, and our uncertainty of understanding the relative contributions of these pathways is compounded by the absence of information about social and biological conditions prior to the start dates for many key studies, and also by the consistency of, of uh, social environments over time. Now to control for some of these possibilities, we can turn to animal models where we're able to eliminate variation in some of these mediators. Animals all might have similar access to healthcare. And in experimental settings, we can actually address social causation um, by manipulating uh, social environmental experiences. And, and by comparison, the social environments in non-human animals, as illustrated by that rainbow uh, graph uh, uh, figure that Dan showed, uh, the social environments in non-human animals are much simpler um, and are, are best studied and probably most relevant to health, reproduction, and survival at, at the local level where co-resident or individuals living in the same group directly interact. Um, I, Jenny, can I hand this next slide over to you? Just two, two examples from experimental studies. Oh, sure, yeah. So, um, 
you know, Noah pointed out that the observation that social adversity, not just socioeconomic status, but also social isolation, um, uh, early life adversity, you know, there's a variety of different measures are correlated with health and mortality outcomes in humans, you know, that is consistent with a number of different non mutually exclusive pathways. Um, and I, I found it quite striking that some of the same data sets have been used to um, to support one pathway or, or, or another, even though the data set is, is the same. Um, what Noah was alluding to is the fact that in some cases, it's been possible to manipulate aspects of the social environment in particularly captive or lab model systems to ask whether if you hold uh, all other aspects of the environment the same, you know, to the degree, to the degree that's possible, whether you see an outcome from um, uh, chronic social stressors or social adversity in the absence of other apparent material adversity itself. Um, and the two examples uh, that I think Noah put on the slide are one from our colleague Alessandro um, Bartolomucci, who's at University of Minnesota, where they actually placed um, male mice in uh, contact with one another, in, in social contact with one another, but with um, a barrier in between them. And one of those mice in each pair was dominant, and one was subordinate. They actually just let those mice live throughout the, the rest of their natural lifespans, which is a, actually a fairly atypical thing to do, even in short-lived mouse models. And what they found is that the difference in um, uh, life expectancy between dominant and subordinate mice, who were getting the same food, housed in the same environment, it actually could not physically touch one another, could not physically fight one another, was about 12.4%. So just to give you some context, that's about um, the difference that's described in these, these same mouse strains for caloric or dietary restriction, which is one of the most consistently successful uh, environmental interventions in lifespan that we know of. So that was quite striking. Those mice also developed um, atherosclerotic lesions and um, uh, early evidence of tumors um, it, at a rate that, that was far advanced relative to the, the dominant mice. Um, there's also been, been some work in non-human primates and um, one of the one of the studies that um, my lab did and that Noah led when he was a postdoc in the lab um, was based on using social hierarchies in female rhesus macaques as a model for social hierarchies. So there we could place adult females together, they would uh, organize themselves into a social hierarchy, uh, we could follow them for a while and look at what the outcomes were when we held their environments, you know, the size of the groups, their diet, um, uh, their care and, and so on, consistent. And we found that um, even in situations like that, we saw um, some pretty striking differences in the levels of gene activity, particularly in immune-related and pro-inflammatory pathways. And we could take those same females, switch up their social ranks again by putting them in new groups, and that change in social status also drove a change in how their immune systems work. So those are just some examples of the type of work that's being done now to try and isolate aspects of the social environment um, to get at least one of those potential pathways linking um, um, uh, social factors to, to health. Thanks, Jenny. And so Jenny just gave two really clear examples of, of what we can, what causal inference we can draw from these captive controlled experimental studies. But we can also zoom out from these controlled captive studies and look across the lifespan um, of individuals who are of, of species that are shorter lived than humans, yet share many of the same uh, social environmental variables that, that we as humans do, uh, particularly in non-human primates, but also sort of across the animal kingdom. And when we zoom out there, uh, we can, I, I think of it as this like captivity wild continuum, you know, what, what, uh, what you gain in, in captive, very controlled studies and, and then what you lose, but also gain when you, and new things that you gain when you move into more ecologically relevant, genetic environmentally heterogeneous uh, populations in, in the wild and many of these long-term uh, studies of natural uh, populations of animals. And when we, we zoom out and look at these other, uh, look at these wild studies, many of these are, are, are studies in the animals and their natural environments, we see that this social status survival relationship uh, has been found in at least 12 species, or at least evaluated in at least 12 species, with some evidence in the majority of those species, including humans, which together represent multiple transitions from solitary to social living. So here, this tree is showing uh, evidence for 
social status influencing uh, mortality or some other um, fitness, fitness com component of Darwinian fitness uh, in, a, in a number of species. We can also look with respect to social integration, which Jenny mentioned and, and is something we examined in our review. And again, this has been evaluated in at least 12 species, including humans, which together also represent multiple independent transitions to social group living. These are just a couple of the figures from, from our manuscript. And then lastly, we touch a little bit on, on early life adversity or the, the timing and the sensitive periods uh, in which social experiences might be particularly salient and have long lasting effects. Um, and two, exam two, two recent examples, one uh, led by Jenny with Beth Archie, Gene Altman and Susan Alberts uh, in 2016, showing cumulative early life adversity uh, in significantly influencing the median lifespan of adult female baboons in their long-term study of the Ambicelli baboon population. And also a recent study uh, led by Eli Strauss um, showing similar effects, the number of cumulative early life effects or cumulative early life adverse conditions or effects influencing survival uh, in wild spotted hyenas. And then uh, as, as in humans, we, we sort of put forth a, a little pathway uh, similar to, to these uh, schematics that have been shown in some of the human uh, literature and sociology, uh, sociological literature in particular, uh, multiple pathways connect social factors to health and Darwinian fitness in other animals. Um, several of these are analogous to those that have been developed in humans. Uh, arrow one shows you social causation, um, which is strongly supported by some of those studies that Jenny mentioned earlier, where you manipulate exposure to chronic stress while holding uh, other aspects of the environment constant. Um, by contrast, in species which, in which social status might be determined by physical competition, changes in body condition and, and physiological measures of endocrine and immune function can precede changes in status. Again, here, health selection, arrow two. Uh, social environmental links to lifespan can also be mediated through other environmental exposures. And, and lastly, uh, arrows four and five show that early life adversity can pattern or even generate social gradients in adulthood. Um, and then I'd like to just wrap up by mentioning, uh, Jenny, can you briefly mention the animal social networks? Sure. Um, yeah, cool. thanks, for, thanks for adding that slide in. Um, so along with Kathy Mellon-Harris, a sociologist at UNC, and with Alessandra Bartolomucci, the, the mouse aging physiologist that I mentioned earlier, um, we recently were funded by the National Institutes on Aging and um, OBSSR at NIH uh, to develop a, a nationwide research network on, on the use or of animal models or um, comparative research on the social dimensions of health and aging. And so um, if you are interested in potentially participating in the network through workshops or um, uh, pilot opportunities or fellowship opportunities um, or data sharing and protocol sharing in the future, please go to the website and, um, and add yourself to our contact information. We actually have an open call um, for fellowships for graduate students, postdocs, and junior faculty right now if there's something that we can help support in, um, in potentially career development or new research directions linked to the interests of the network. So thanks, Noam. Great, and uh, I think now we can open it up for questions. Okay, great. this is great. Uh, does, do we see any uh, hands raised, Meredith? Do you see any hands raised so far? Not yet. Uh, so do feel free to raise your hand with any questions, but uh, Charlie, it looks like you have put a question in the chat box if you'd like to get us started. Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, when I saw the uh, when I read the paper and I saw figure two with that, um, that's the one on social net social network integration and health. Uh, there was that one exception of the marmot. I, I know in the text you had an explanation for that, but of course, uh, you can imagine what my mind went to, and that's infectious disease. And uh, I was wondering if uh, that kind of social network connection. Uh, could expose animals to more infectious diseases, and that might be a kind of trade-off that, that goes on. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that, and if you wanted to make a case for your 
um, your explanation in the paper. I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> Our explanation in the paper is uh, Dan Blumstein's explanation, who is, oh. the, of course, the, the, um, <laughs> the guy who has been leading the, the Marmot study uh, for many years. Uh, you know, he and, Dan, uh, and Ken Armitage before him. Um, I cannot, you know, I don't see Dan on, on this call. His, so his ideas about what's going on in the marmots may, may be evolving because I know they're continuing to do some of that work. But one of the things he raised is the point that basically every other species in, in those phylogenetic depictions are what um, a behavioral biologists would call um, obligately social, right? Basically, you don't find them in settings where they are on their own, or if they are on their own, it's very, very transient, like a male baboon dispersing to find a new social group or something like that. Mm -hmm. They always live in groups, whereas um, marmots do not always have to live in groups. They're facultatively social, and so that may be a key difference. Um, very hard to uh, to pin down because that's an N of one comparison. You know, Charlie, as you're very well familiar, that makes uh, phylogenetic comparisons a little bit hard. Um, but that's one one potential possibility. Yeah. Hey, so it looks like we have quite a few hands raised now. So let's go first to Bernie Crespi. Bernie, go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah, I wanted to thank the speakers. That was great. I just had a question about causation and the processes involved. It looked as though uh, so-called health selection and social selection are going in, in opposite directions in such a way as there could be positive feedback going on between them. So if you have, if you have an individual in, in good conditions, they would have high social status, which would lead to good health, which would maintain high social status and, and vice versa for people or animals in poor conditions. So have you, have you looked for or thought about the possibility of uh, vicious cycles or positive feedbacks being involved in the associations between uh, these variables? Um, I can, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, that's a hard question, you know, and I think the import, well, okay, so, so one of the reasons that people study animal models, of course, is to make things a bit simpler than it is in humans. And I think what's emerged, and Dan, you should chime in here, um, from many, many, many decades of studies on human populations is actually how complex the relationship between social environments and health and physiological outcomes actually are. So I would say that in most of the, um, most of the studies that we're, we, we've sort of talked about and cited in the paper have really tried to go after one, one of those pathways, right? They've sort of um, designed their study or taken advantage of an existing study in such a way that they are best powered to elucidate one possible connection. So even in that figure that Noah showed at the end, which shows alternative pathways coming from animal studies, like those pathways tend not to be pathways that have been well detailed in the same population. That being said, they're clearly not mutually exclusive. And I think the, the best position types of studies to go after those co-acting pathways are actually the, the long-term field studies because they have full life course and, and often now multi-generational multi information. Um, so one, I don't think this is exactly what you're, what you're suggesting, but I think it's related. Um, one example that I can offer is that in the long-term baboon population that I study, um, uh, Matthew Zippel, Susan Alberts, and colleagues have shown that early life adversity predicts shorter lifespans for female baboons as it, as it does in, in humans. Um, but those female baboons, if they grow up and have kids of their own, also end up having um, uh, kids who are less likely to make it through the juvenile period. So that becomes sort of a multi-generational cycle of, um, of uh, adversity and disadvantage uh, that is perhaps in some senses reminiscent of some of the things that we've observed in, in, that have been observed in humans. Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll go next to Riyadh Abed, who has a hand raised. Riyadh, you can go ahead. Riyadh, are you there? Yeah, yes, Great. thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, thank you very much for um, 
very interesting paper and presentation. Um, I was wondering whether you, you have any thoughts about this current uh, raging debate now about uh, the mortality of COVID with uh, different ethnic groups, um, with um, uh, black and Asian uh, minorities in the UK and um, maybe across other Western countries as well, um, uh, showing high mortality uh, rates, um, whereas uh, the populations that they actually come from, uh, let's say in the Caribbean and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, and in the Indian subcontinent, actually uh, those high mortality rates um, are not evident. Um, so there must be something else going on uh, because there, it's, it doesn't seem to be uh, the, the high risk of mortality doesn't seem to be um, inherent in the ethnic or racial groups. It, it seems to be something about uh, their situation uh, within uh, the Western countries that they uh, reside in now. So um, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a question we've actually gotten a lot uh, recently since this paper came out. You know, one, while we are all social distancing and here we're talking about how your social connections influence um, your health and survival, health and well-being. Uh, but also the fact that we see huge social disparities in health in these underlying conditions, right? Um, that a lot of these New York Times had a really great infographic, I think, last week or, or two weeks ago. Um, showing the uh, the income and racial disparities in pre-existing conditions that might increase the severity of, of your COVID uh, infection and what happens and ultimately to higher mortality rates. Um, so certainly some of these social disparities in, in health uh, increase, you know, lead to the, are, are linked to, you know, these inflammatory diseases, these non-communicable non -communicable diseases in, in large part uh, that increase uh, the, the risk or your susceptibility or the severity of, of many other diseases and, and, you know, particularly acutely the COVID-19. I don't know if Dan has anything to add on there, Jenny, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that my guess is that uh, ancestry, um, at least from sort of a, a, a genetic or by a lot, like probably has very little to do with those differences, you know. Uh, here in the United States, we see dramatic differences in um, incidence, exposure, and policy from city to city and state to state. And those obviously have um, an enormous um, amount of influence on uh, infection rates and spread and um, disease outcomes. So, you know, Noah's talking about underlying conditions. I, I think it's also worth thinking about differences in exposure that may map on to um, conceptions of ancestry and that of course are, are you know very likely to differ depending on where you live and what your your position in that society is likely to be. Dan, do you have anything to add? I, I think that pretty much sums it up. I mean certainly uh, the the dominant interpretation in, in the public health community that I live in of the differences in, in particular, COVID mortality, but, but also infection is that it's, it's differences in these social determinants of health that accompany uh, people's ancestry and not any uh, particular intrinsic feature of that ancestry. Um, so, it, you know, if we look at New York City, you can see that there are higher rates of infection and worse outcomes for people who live in uh, poor neighborhoods where uh, there is uh, denser housing where fewer people are able to effectively social distance at home, where more people uh, are having to go to work out in the in the world, um, and where the background prevalence of conditions that worsen the outcome of COVID infection is much higher. Uh, and I'll I'll put in a little plug for my particular area of interest, which is you know that. Um, COVID appears to be much worse for people who are chronologically older. And uh, the evidence we have so far suggests that we might think about these gradients in uh, particularly COVID mortality as reflecting differences in biological processes of aging unfolding uh, across these different population segments, again, as a function of 
these social determinants of health. Great, thanks so much for those perspectives. Uh, next up, we have Catherine Ward. Catherine, you can go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you. First, I want to say thank you, Meredith and Charlie and everybody for holding these. It's um, great for some of us that might not have a chance to interact with you to be able to Zoom so so easily. So thank you. I've been enjoying them very much. I'm a practicing nurse practitioner and faculty member at the University of Utah, and I also am working on a PhD in anthropology here in my old age. <laughs> So I've been looking at, this is one of the things, discussion groups uh, among the people I work with um, here. And I, I also do some work in Rwanda. And I keep sort of bringing up the, the population of Rwanda as kind of a natural experiment in early childhood adversity. Because here you have a, a country that 26 years ago was, you know, just really devastated by the genocide. One of the um, statistics I heard there was that 70% of children lost one or more relatives in the genocide and 80% of those children witnessed that killing. Um, you know, the country experienced another five years of really devastating poverty and disease and just, you know, sort of a, a real, um, I, I mean, I don't need to go on and describe it, but, but in those 26 years, this is a country that has now gone from, you know, to abject poverty to being really poised to, to to be considered a, a developed country. Um, life expectancy is, is um, yeah, not quite doubled, but nearly um, GDP is better. People are delaying childbearing, you know, minimizing their family. Some of those things that we sort of associate with the adverse childhood experiences that then influence early reproductive decisions and early um, you know, like risk-taking behaviors and things that lead to, to other problems. And so it's just, I, it's really like, like working in Rwanda, I think oh, we, we should be looking at this whole issue from a more of a positive deviance kind of perspective. I appreciate your graph that said it's, you know, maybe a gradient of where you are in the socioeconomic strata, because that, that resonates with me with this in mind that, um, you know, maybe when the whole population goes through something that awful that you band together and um, but but I you know I think here is an entire country of children who live through some of the worst adversity imaginable and um, you know their, their trajectory certainly doesn't look like 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 they're um, you know everyone's on this shortened lifespan and increased disease in fact quite the opposite. I mean, I think what you're touching on, Catherine, is one of the questions that um, that many researchers are most interested in, which is what is the explanation for heterogeneity in the response to um, social adversity, whether it's early in life or, or, you know, in adulthood or later in life, right? I mean, I think it is very comfortable to most of us that um, people who undergo the same sort of objective experience don't respond in the same kind of ways and um, understanding that variation is going to be really important right for for predicting who's most vulnerable and potentially coming up with ways to try and proactively address the the negative consequences of adversity so yeah I mean absolutely it's a fascinating question and there's lots of lots of ideas out there about why why a and not B and I, I think also following up on that, I think it's a, a great comment you made. Uh, following up on that, I would also think that that highlights um, who you're being compared to or who you're interacting with, right? And so if we're talking about Rwanda as a country, um, it could be the case that maybe the relative disparities aren't as much um, going forward. So just uh, something we point out, you know, in animals, we think about them as within co-resident groups, and it's really difficult to compare an animal in one group to, to, to another social group. That's right. Great, thanks for that. Uh, next up for the raised hands, we have Ron Willis. Ron, you can go ahead. Ron, if you're talking, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep, perfect. I, I thought it was a little funny earlier, you were talking about the Marmot studies, given Michael Marmot is the world leader in social determinants of health. However, my question is, Rather than focus on, focusing on the biology, which I think makes sense, say, 12,000 years ago when we were hunter-gatherers, is it not the case that since the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, 
human societies are nothing like animal societies. And that's a far bigger factor behind all of this. I mean, I come very much from a tradition in which humans are animals and, you know, a, a small amount of time may change our environments a lot, but uh, not fundamentally change um, our, our, for example, needs for social interaction or our tendency to be hierarchical. Um, we were a social species long, long before we were even humans. And so I think that your point is well taken in the sense that there are certain aspects of the social environment that are very difficult to model in, um, in other animals. Um, Noah alluded to one of them in the sense that, you know, we can put ourselves on a socioeconomic status ladder uh, against millions of people who we've never met before and will never meet again, right? But, um, uh, but despite those sort of differences in scale and certainly differences in the way that measurements and experiments can be conducted, I think one of the points that we were attempting to make in the review is that some of the um, directions of effects and often even the effect sizes that relate things like social integration or early social adversity or socioeconomic status or social status um, in other animals uh, to, to health and mortality outcomes in humans are actually very much recapitulated in other social mammals. And I actually think, if anything, that suggests that there is um, some fundamental biology that we should pay attention to. And as a number of people have brought up in the comments already, there is a lot of people who are studying um, um, health, human health, in one aspect or another, right, in the biomedical sciences, who, um, you know, may benefit from thinking about our social environments as part of human biology. Um, I actually remember having a conversation with, with Kathy Mullen Harris, a sociologist on the paper, um, I don't know, probably a couple years ago. And I just kind of said, well, I don't, you know, Kathy, I think most biologists don't really think there are social determinants of health. And it's not that they would say, um, I don't believe that this exists. They just don't think about it because if you actually think this matters, Right, and if it influences anything about um, basic physiological function, especially the stress response, for instance, or um, a, the immune response, then you would build it into the way that you do your studies. And so I think um, the, the divide between the social and the biological is often um, more exaggerated than it actually is in practice. I mean, there are some remarkable animal studies that suggest uh, large differences in rates of cancer met metastasis, for instance, or development of atherosclerosis from differences in the social environment. Um, and those are experimental studies that can't be done in humans. So I, I am, I'm like on the same page as you, <laughs> that there are things that humans do that are remarkable. And Sapolsky made this argument a long time ago that, boy, what humans have done is taken social hierarchy and push it to an extreme that it's impossible to imagine. In, in humans, that we're better at it than we're better at making social gradients than any other species. But that doesn't mean there aren't things in common that allow us to bring to bear a tool um, that biologists use all the time to study all kinds of other kinds of phenomena that I think has been underutilized in um, thinking about the social determinants of health. I would also add that this sort of gets at the, the fundamental cause while well, what's causing the patterning of the distribution of resources or whatever it might be at any given time, uh, it still exerts some effects on our, you know, biology, health, well-being, and survival. Thanks. Uh, next up for a question, we have Alejandra Nunez de la Mora. Alejandra, you can go ahead with your question. Hi, everybody. Um, to the authors, I very much agree with the point about you know, diversifying the studies on social environment and health to non-Western populations and how that may um, help us consider other social conditions that may be classified as adverse. I do work in such kind of populations and I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear what, what do you see in the literature and, and where do you think we should go? Thank you. Dan, I wonder, do you want to take some of that? You are, you know, more grounded in human population studies and uh, where they come from. Sure. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there was just a paper 
that Michael Gervin's group published uh, like days ago um, about the Timane in, uh, in the Amazon, um, you know, suggesting that these, these social gradients um, exist and exert profound effects on health uh, in uh, non, uh, distinctly non uh, weird setting, right? So Western and industrialized and so forth. Uh, so I think that um, people have taken social gradients research out of the developed West and into other settings and uh, are able to reproduce the basic effects in much the same way that, that when you examine social hierarchies in, in animal experiments, you can reproduce the basic effects. But I think your point that um, what constitutes the, the relevant dimensions of a social hierarchy or what the particular mechanisms uh, through which that hierarchy impacts health are may differ uh, across population strata. Um, and so, uh, you know, for example, people who work in uh, regions that are prone to extreme weather events may focus on, uh, you know, sort of where housing lies relative to floodplains uh, and, and how access to clean water may, may vary um, uh, seasonally. Um, so they've exploited different kinds of designs to establish these effects and also to identify um, policy means of improving health conditions or um, uh, moderating the social gradient. Um, so I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that specifically answers your question, but, but I think that um, the, there's certainly ample human literature to establish that these social gradients in health are not specific to um, industrialized settings. Uh, and I think that the, in some sense, the point of the fundamental causes approach to thinking about this problem is that the specific mediators of social gradients in health are not necessarily especially important when we try to understand the, the larger dimensions of the problem. They become highly relevant when we begin considering what interventions we should deploy to mitigate social gradients of health in a particular situation. Um, and then we move uh, somewhat outside of the realm of uh, evolutionary medicine and, and into the realm of public policy. Yeah, no, I agree. I was not suggesting that there would be any different mechanisms or pathways or processes. It's more on a practical level. You know, the construct that you build around adversity is very bicultural. And I think that what I find is that in the literature is that we haven't explored that, the nuances of that. So it becomes a problem when you're doing the experiments or the analysis or the protocols or the designs because you know you're looking for something, but it's not always easy to capture what you want because the construct is built in a different setting. So I just think there's a lot of work there to do in terms of, um, yeah, field work uh, constructs useful in the field. I think you're totally right. And it is one of those things where, uh, you know, this work has to be done with, with um, the participation of a wide variety of people who have familiarity with the particular populations, you know, intimate familiarity with the particular populations under study. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, one really clear case to me is in terms of what a, a typical or normal or healthy family structure is supposed to look That's like, right. which can differ a lot between populations. Mm -hmm. and, and so in, in the sort of um, Western version of the, the, the ACES framework, it, it, it's very focused and the data is most available, right, for, for for maternal um, uh, presence and participation and stuff like that. And it's based around a family structure that is very nuclear in, in, in the way that um, folks in westernized nations live. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Lots of work to do. Thank you. Great. So I think we have time for one last question. And I know uh, Joseph Graves has had a question for a while. So we'll go ahead and go to you, Joe. More, mine is more comment. Than, than a question, uh, and it had to do with the um, prevalence and severity of COVID 2019 in African American and Afro British populations. Er, early on in, in February, I made the prediction that prevalence and um, severity would be greatest amongst the most socially subordinated populations um, for reasons that seem to follow very well with the history of. Uh, epidemics in those populations, along with you know other um, 
complex disease prevalence patterns. Um, in terms of you know, genetic resistance, there was a paper that came out in December of 2019 that looked at HLA variants um, that might, using, using a bioinformatic approach, that might confer some resistance to COVID and some that would confer extra susceptibility to COVID. And it turns out that both classes of variants are at such a low frequency and are not differentiated in, in, in any human populations. So to the degree to which at least HLA would be playing a role, it, it doesn't play a role. It really has much more to do with the social conditions in which those populations live with regard to whether they're going to be exposed to the virus and then what kind of healthcare is available for those individuals in those situations. And going back to you know the smallpox pandemic or epidemic uh, right after the Civil War, African Americans have led the way in virtually every epidemic disease that we have records for. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about the genetic mapping studies that are are, are looking for. Um, you know, variants that might be associated with COVID susceptibility or, or progression. But I think that, you know, the idea that that's going to be a very strong predictor of um, individual outcomes is, is, would be a very naive take on that kind of work. Um, what is often more promising for um, at least some GWAS type folks is the idea that if you find you know, hits, it tells you something about the actual biology of the disease. Maybe it suggests something drug targetable, or maybe it suggests something um, that would be an intervention that isn't about you're going to get it and you're not going to get it. But now we know a little bit more about how the how the pathogen, how the actual bug works. So yeah, thanks for that, Joe. Anything else from Dan or Noah related to that? Any last words, guys? Anything we didn't get to, you feel like we should have? No, thank you. Okay. Dan, how about you? No, I think that was a great note to end on. Okay. If anyone, if anyone um, has any more questions, I know we didn't get to them. Feel free to, to send us an email and we'll, and we'll respond as best we can. Okay, well, I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk with uh, this group. Um, it's really fantastic to, um, you know, to have this paper out, by the way, and to include it. You know, a lot of these images I can imagine are going to appear in uh, many evolutionary medicine and other lectures for a long time to come, and this is going to be a classic paper. Um, so, um, you know, thanks so much for sharing this uh, with us and, and, and helping us uh, understand this better through this conversation. I also want to thank Meredith for uh, helping organize this and keeping the questions on track. Meredith, as usual, you did a fantastic job on this. Um, if you want to stay in touch with uh, Club Med, I put a, a link, a couple of links into the uh, to the chat. You can go to our website and see uh, the upcoming. Well, I don't think we put them in there yet. So let me tell you what the upcoming ones are. By the way, this is our 11th of these. It's sort of hard to believe. Um, and I think the biggest, uh, the highest number of participants, is that true, Meredith? I think this might be the highest so far. It is, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, over time, which is a nice thing to see. And we see a lot of you coming back every time. Um, we have next week, we have Bernie Crespi, who's uh, going to be talking about bacterial selection. I did say that correctly. You'll have to find out more uh, soon. Um, and basically, um, um, looking at bats and thinking about them as, as sources of infectious disease, as I understand it from Bernie. Uh, after that, uh, June 29th, we have Barb, I'm sorry, June 30th, we have Barb Natterson Horowitz. It's going to be a book club, and she's going to be talking about her book uh, and uh, coming of age on planet Earth and nature of adolescence and humans and other animals. That's going to be a great conversation as well. And then after that, we have Verena Schooneman from Zurich, and she's going to be talking about paleogenetics. And I'll tell you, we have two or three others in line uh, after that. And so we have a schedule, I think, almost all the way through July. So please join us again. And thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Jenny and Noah and Dan, for a really fantastic uh, club of men. Thanks for taking Carly, can I just jump in one for just a yeah. second at the end? I Please. mentioned that there's a fellowship call right now for people who are interested in funding. So I'm just going to put the link in, in the window. This is our first fellowship from the 
you know, social aging network, and it's named after the late great Bruce McEwen, who was just such a, a visionary in thinking about the biology of stress and the utility of both studies in humans and animal models. So if you have anything that, you know, we, we can again help you with to, to further research in this area, please think about sending an, uh, in an application. Um, the deadline is uh, June 30th and it is grad students, postdocs, junior faculty. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, thanks everyone. We hope to see you next week.